At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things, but I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations plus our team's experience to make stocking your team's break room easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. I never did anything to harm my daughter or my granddaughter. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. To get the crime writers on after show right now, go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoy and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And on this episode, a church leader from Mexico is accused of sexually abusing women and children for years. His survivors want their day in court. We'll discuss the HBO series Unveiled, Surviving La Luz del Mundo. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, and host of the These Are Their Stories podcast, my husband and love of my life, Kevin Flynn. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. Also with us is private investigator, certified pet detective, resident cat lady, and author of the best-selling The Final Curtain, Laura Bricker. Hi, Laura. Hey, Rebecca. Actually, I think I've already announced this, but super exciting because it was on social media this week. The Final Curtain, number one at Water Street Bookstore, dead on deadline, number two. Yep. Thank you, Crime Writers on People. Freaking amazing. Dan with the good hair, thanks you for supporting his good hair. I love how you say Dan with the good hair. We just say hot Dan. It's just like... A hot Dan. Hot it's Dan. Code. He's like my, my big brother, Dan. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's just code. It's code for hot Dan. Let's be real. <laughs> and finally, our captain of all things cynical, the author of the City Trilogy of Novels, host of the Strange Arrivals podcast, and our Patreon Deep Dive Book Club podcast host, Toby Ball. Hi, Toby. Hello, Rebecca. So, Kevin, what is coming up on Thursday's podcast? This is obviously Monday's fine program. Yeah, on Thursday, we're going to be talking about the podcast Alabama Astronaut. All right. That's a really interesting one. Looking forward to that discussion. A lot of music. Mm -hmm. So, Kevin, before we get into tonight's discussion, we have a quick thing to discuss. Yeah. Corrictorgate. Oh, no. What is that? (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. So, Toby, on last week's show... You pronounced a word in a very interesting way, and I did not comment on it at the time, and I didn't think anyone was going to notice. Was it the word interesting? It was the word caricature. Caricature? (laughs) Uh, Otherwise known as caricature. And you were talking about the characters in Glass Onion, and uh, you were describing as people would say caricatures, but you said caricatures. 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 I had never heard anyone pronounce the word that way before, but I just let it go by. Said nothing, did nothing. And I was like, in my head, it was late at night. I was like, that could be potentially an alternative pronunciation. But hey, it's late. Let's just let it go. And um, I am wondering, because someone on our Facebook page said, so is no one going to talk about Toby's pronunciation? (laughs) Is it like 40 people dead? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm just curious. Where did you learn to pronounce the word that way? Or is it one of those things where you've only ever seen it written and you've never heard it heard out loud before? Or did it just spill out of your mouth like that? Uh, I feel like I alternate between caricature and caricature. <laughs> with caricature? Just about, uh, just like about equally. Yeah. So I don't know why I say it one way or the other at different times. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know who I heard say caricature and why that stuck in my head. Because I know if somebody's it was Benoit like, Blanc. <laughs> if you showed me on like an index card, like, how do you pronounce this? I think I would say caricature. Yeah. But in the course of conversation amongst friends, sometimes I let loose with a caricature. Ah. It's sort of like um, my coworker, Taylor Quimby, who's a genius, says alternate. And he, alternate? he yeah. can't not say it. Ah. And it's gotten to the point where I'm like, just don't use that word because it makes you sound so stupid. Oh my God. Like you'll say like the most like unbelievably articulate thing. And then I'll be like, but then in an alternate universe, and I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Like no one says the well, word. We had this, um, 
DPW director here in Exeter, where I live at one point, when he used to talk about facilities in town, he'd be like, he called them a facilities. He'd be like, you know, the facilities. And I'm like, you mean the facilities? <laughs> Fix, you know, the facilities. And I'm like, okay. When I was in college, the guy who uh, was on the maintenance crew would, uh, you know, he would go into a room and he, they'd have to announce themselves. So yeah. it was, it was maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah it's like you with it's like some people do have like regional things like you say connecticut which is like the way people yeah. from your part of massachusetts say connecticut, connecticut. what connecticut. is it connecticut it's connecticut which Can- is how it's spelled and pronounced. connecticut but you you say connecticut which yeah. is always funny to me but like literally so toby no seriously like i don't actually want to make sure i don't want to make fun of you i'm, I'm also I like it oh it's just way too late i also that. like <laughs> it too but in the moment i just want to say like I did. I processed it, and I was like, "Ah, let's just let it go." <laughs> and then people. And somebody was like, "This is the second time in a month that people will be giving Toby a hard time about his pronunciation of something." I was like, "I missed the first one. What word did I mispronounce before?" Mm. Uh, but I don't know yet. What was mm. it? Was it interesting? But that's not a mispronunciation. That's just a drop T, which that's is just yeah. that's, Tobyism. That's also very common. Because also, by the way, Taylor Quimby also says interesting. In yeah, addition the to people saying from our culture, mine and Taylor's culture, mm. you say interesting. And do you say alternate? I don't say alternate. No. <laughs> do you say pyramid instead of period? <laughs> pyramid? That's just the wrong word. The, the, yeah, I, I try and use correct words I'm as on much my as possible. Pyramid. <laughs> I'm on my pyramid right now. <laughs> All right. Well, Toby, it's not really a gate. It was just something that I think that uh, was not, interesting to not me. Not a gate. It doesn't rise to the level of gate. <laughs> Nothing. We can hold hearings gate. if you want. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. Well, when we find one in your garage, then we can hold hearings. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay. Well, let Kevin, should we talk about the documentary we're going to be talking about uh, this podcast? Let's get into it. Let's get into it. And by the way, speaking of pronunciation, anyone who heard last week's outtakes oh, yes. know that this was a challenging one for you. I know now. You know now. Yeah, it's La Luz del Mundo. Yes. So we're going to go del, ahead and... Del Mundo. We're going to go ahead and drop yeah. that first clip. All right. Right now. Leading off. It's really interesting how they detect the right person. You have to be poor and you have to be broken for you to need somebody who's telling you that he has all the answers in the world. As head of La Luz del Mundo, third-generation church leader Nason Joaquin Garcia promised eternal salvation. All the while, he used his position as apostle to groom children and young women for sexual abuse for years. I was at his mercy for anything he wanted, and he used that to make me his sex slave. And I had to remain quiet, like a sacrificial lamb. When Garcia's victims in the U.S. and Mexico meet on Reddit and compare stories, they band together to expose the church's secret. Once seeming untouchable, they convince authorities to go after Garcia and hold him accountable. This is an organized practice implemented by the Apostle key leaders and other individuals within the organization. HBO's Unveiled, Surviving La Luz del Mundo is the latest documentary exploring the sins of religious leaders using their position as God's messenger to coerce followers into sexual exploitation. It provides plenty of space for American and Mexican victims to tell their truth and covers Garcia's fall from grace. Spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about plot points from Unveiled. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes for our thumbs up or thumbs down reviews. Now, Laura, you wrote the first note in your notes that there is one of these churches in Maine. But I would like to point out to you, there are three of them in New Hampshire. Three. Okay, where are the ones in New Hampshire? Mashua, Manchester, and Concord? And Concord, yes. Uh, one of just a few miles from where we're sitting, one in Manchester, and one in Nashua. And apparently they're, they're very small. They open like in storefronts and so forth. Mm. This is a franchise-type church that is really, really ingrained and everywhere. And I hadn't heard of it before. Is this the first time you've heard of the Light of the World Church, Laura? Yeah, this was the first time I've heard of this. And I think that was what was so interesting to me is that Going into this, it stands out to me, this is a huge church. It's a huge church that's based in Christianity. It's all over the world. But then, like you said, you do a little bit of Googling, you can find little locations of this everywhere that you never even knew existed. So as soon as I found, well, now that I know about the New Hampshire ones, 
I might go there first. But I have a friend who is a, I'm going to just call them an eccentric minister. Um, and this is not <laughs> Minister Emily or Minister Heidi. This is my super eccentric minister friend who likes to church hop. And I was like, we're going to go in. And she said, we're going in separately because they're going to love bomb us. Yes. We need to go in separately to get the full story. I think that's what's so interesting about these places is that they do sort of fly under the radar because, you know, there's another thing in New Hampshire up in, in Littleton. It's like the something yellow deli or something. And it's another cult thing. And that's how these type of organizations sustain themselves is that they are everywhere like that. And you don't, you don't think, oh yeah, in New Hampshire, we're going to have this like, and, and this is like, all I could think of was this is like Toby's wheelhouse as I was watching this. But I, I think it is interesting to see it on the bigger scale. And then in the smaller scale, like, oh, hey, we could go to Concord, New Hampshire and go to the light of the world church and um, be dance you know, for people, dance for people and put whipped cream on our breasts. Well, but here's the whole thing that I, question because like Toby, like kind of like Scientology and other religions, right? It seems like there's this illusion of bigness and grandeur and, and granted they do obviously have lots of locations everywhere. Right. But it, there's no like ownership of property. Lots of these locations. It's obviously like just a lot of locations and, and people everywhere. There's a sense of scale and a sense of bigness and a sense of being everywhere but isn't that also part of the story that these churches tell that they do own a lot of things in these concentrated places and they have big buildings somewhere, but then the story is tendrils everywhere. And that's part of the, the lore is that we're everywhere and we're huge. And you're left to question like, how, how did this happen? You know, and is that really true or real? Because here I am, I'm like, there's three churches in New Hampshire one of them is literally in a strip mall next to a hair salon, like six miles from here. And like when I Google mapped it, like it can maybe fit like eight people in it. So I, I you just find yourself wondering, like how much of it is the lore of the organization and how much of it is the size of the organization, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I guess if there's like even if the churches are small, if there's three churches in New Hampshire, yep. which the Latino population is not huge. Like they must, they must have churches a lot of places. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think that was one of the things I was kind of thought was missing and I don't really know maybe even if it was that important or whether it's just something I was wondering about, which is exactly how big are they and how did they get so big? Like how did from, you know, in a hundred years, why did this particular church grow to be in, you know, six continents and have millions of people and this kind of cool, but also kind of nuts, like big church that they, they built in Jalisco. Um, I think it's mostly, I mean, they don't really go into it either, but it seems like it's mostly a Spanish speaking thing. Like the only person that you really see who's not of Latino origin is Christopher, like the boyfriend. The um, husband. Yeah. The husband. Oh, that's right. So again, it's like, it sort of exists within in the U S within a certain sort of ethnic ethnic group you get a little bit of history but you basically get dropped into it you know as of like 20 years ago and it's just like it is what it is at that point and that's kind of where we jump in and other than sort of hearing about like a little bit about how it was started you don't really get much of a sense of the history of it or how it grew or how it got to be where it was see that was my whole thing the christopher story alondra's husband was very interesting to me because he joined and he was in, like he went there to like date her, right? But there was something about it that had to have been appealing enough that he was willing to keep going. Like that was interesting to me. I'm like, it must be an okay place to go. It must be positive. It must feel not bad if you're new there. And that was, that to me, I, I also felt like was missing is all we heard was all these bad stories about this place, but there must have well, been something compelling. Yeah, I mean, I think anyone who goes to a church regularly finds something compelling about it. I tell you, even... The victims here talked a lot about like the other things that they got from the church, the things that, you know, made them feel good and felt like, you know, they were going to be saved. And, you know, strong hate, sense of community, strong sense of community. Yeah. You hate to put it this way, but all the people who weren't victimized are like, yeah, this is a great church. But you see that in the Catholic Church. You see that in Scientology. You see that in LDS. So. Fortunately, this is not a new story. Right. In, in sort of the broader sense that we often see. In the news and now through these documentaries, multiple cases of different religious 
sex and major religions where men in power abuse that power and are able to specifically in the religion one, because we saw a lot of like gurus like Keith Raniere and Bikram and all those guys, but they're able to sort of leverage this idea of eternal salvation and damnation. Like if you don't do what the apostle says, then you're probably going to go to hell. So if the apostle says, I can't sin, so go ahead and touch me this way or whatever, you know, you're going to be torn. And so this is one of the ways they, they're able to coerce the faithful into becoming victims. So it's, it's, you know, it's a lot of influence, but they're able to, you know, leverage their faith and turn it against them. And that's another you know, way that you get this whole like next generation of victim abusers who work to become groomers as well within the organization because it's just, you know, it's just like this, uh, this wheel that keeps spinning, you know, that everybody's on it. And, you know, I mean, what can you say that that's, it's, it's horrible, but in a way, this is not a new story to us. No. It's just the location yeah. is different. The yeah. players are different. Yeah. But, you know, well, I you think, still want to dress up little girls and make them dance for you. That's like fucked up. Well, it's so similar to so many things that we have reviewed. Yes. Well, it's different in one way. What's that? The lawyer makes the point at the end that this is a story about people of color and like the big stories that we hear about where people get punished the most are about white people. There is a difference in the way certain victims are treated in this court system. I think that the terms of the plea agreement would have been different if these were five white girls as opposed to five Latina women. And and I think that that's not unimportant because, you know, I think it's yeah. really easy to say, we've heard this story before. We've seen documentaries like this before. We've heard victims tell these stories before. But really, like the moral of this story is that the guy at the center of this, you know, was able to plead out uh, and betray all of these victims who came forward, you know, at great risk to themselves. And, you know, the prosecutors are patting themselves in the back and feeling really good about it. And they are still another plea deal. Yeah. Not satisfied and still being threatened and still at great risk. And, you know, all these white men with white victims who and white people with white victims who you can argue perhaps the, the systemic abuse is less stark than it is here. This generational systemic abuse we're talking here um, didn't see this kind of injustice. Well, if you're going to jump all the way to the end, then I got to ask the question. It seems like when uh, Garcia is on trial, well, he's pre-trial, that he's got this very savvy lawyer who, as long as you keep paying him, will find a way to mm -hmm. run out the clock. They kind of glanced, you know, gl uh, went right by it. But, Laura, did you pick up that what ended up happening was that at some point the prosecutors fucked up something on Discovery, that they held back something that maybe they should have and then torpedoed their case, which is Text why. Text messages. Which is why they just had to offer a plea and get as much as they could. Otherwise, they would have gone for a, a Keith Raniere type of uh, conviction. Yeah. But despite that, I guess what still enraged me about this is the fact that the victims were not even consulted on what was happening with this plea deal. So they yeah, they fucked up. But I don't know about your experience, but my experience working in the criminal justice system was that when there was a case where there were victims of sexual assault, abuse, et cetera, the victim witness advocate is always communicating with them and that they need to be on board with a plea deal. And I think that's what was so troubling about this outcome was that they were, they were blindsided and they were not consulted. And even the judge was like, sorry, my hands are tied. So the prosecution fucked up. And at the same time, yes, Rebecca, it was five Latina women, not five white women. Yeah. I mean, I have a theory about why they fucked up. I have a theory. Okay. What's your theory, Rebecca? I think the text messages would have weakened their case and that's why they didn't disclose them. Because we saw that we saw Sochil's text messages uh -huh. and they seemed consensual, right? Because that's the pattern of abuse. You get pulled in, you are groomed to think you're in a relationship that is good because that's how the power dynamic is. And so if you look at Sochil's text messages, her husband 
who, by the way, is the most like wonderful, handsome saint in the entire world, immediately saw them and realized this is fucked up. You're being abused. But on their face, they looked like, yes, I'll send you photos, you know, hearts, kisses, all that. And I would not be surprised if the text messages from these victims were not dissimilar. That's my theory. Have you checked your text messages? Because I just sent you one saying we should talk about some business. Are we switching to the business section right now? Is yeah. that what we're doing? Okay. Doing the business section. All right. Well, like, for time's sake, let's do that. And then we'll get back to the story. So, Kevin, just for to take a break for time's sake. It's a very ungraceful transition, but I know we have to do it. What do we got going on in the business section, Kevin, right now? Ungraceful transition is what I'm about, baby. Uh, that's true. That's You're my bag, for that. baby. You're famous for that. Right now on Patreon, you can listen to the Crime Writers on After Show. It's a special one. On Thursday, we're going to be talking about Alabama astronaut, but Toby was able to talk first with some of the uh, people that made that podcast. Toby, what are we going to hear? Uh, well, I, I couldn't arrange to talk to them both at the same time because one of them is at a singer-songwriter convention or something down in Florida, and the other one had something else going on. So it's I'm called having, American Idol. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I had separate conversations with, uh, with Abe Partridge, who is uh, the guy who's sort of does the... He's the Alabama astronaut. That's yeah. pretty amazing, Tobes. And then uh, a separate one with uh, with Farrell Gibbs, who is the sort of the host and guide through this. So uh, interesting conversations. So yeah, hopefully people will check it out. All right. That's very exciting. Thanks for doing our work for us, Toby. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I know. Nice lift. Also coming up on Patreon, Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club. Toby just did a new book, and uh, tell us about uh, what it was called. It was called with Trailed? It was called Trailed. It's about uh, murders of two women in the Shenandoah National Forest in 1996. And my guests were Allison Horrocks and Janet Varney. And Allison is actually a uh, a ranger, a national park ranger. Mm. And just had a ton of insight into the way the national park works, you know, crime in national parks, mm. all this stuff. It was did she super, tell you only you can prevent forest fires? She did. She yeah. did. And I've been slacking. Um, and we also had a Crime Writers On listener, Karen Oyerly. She, I think, works for the, the, the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, or maybe that was where she was working. And now she works for another one. Anyway... She works for a big state bureau and is in charge of uh, some aspect of DNA analysis. And she came on and talked about DNA analysis for, you know, 10 minutes. It was super interesting. So it's a it's a slightly different deep dive than usual. We, we actually have people who are experts in what they're talking about. Nice. Uh, yeah, so that's different. If that's your thing, check it out. And uh, yeah, it was a really fun conversation. Uh, last night, my son had some friends over and I came in the living room and they were watching Key and Peel. And who should appear on our screen but Janet Varney in an old episode of Key and Peele, right? I was like, it's Janet. She got the punchline at the end. This is very exciting. I was like, I know her. Also, also in Patreon, you can hear the latest episode of Married with Podcast. Yes, a good one. In this episode, Rebecca and I uh, take uh, some questions from listeners and dole out advice like the woman whose brother-in-law keeps giving pot and booze to her son. Yes. Oh. And he's 19. So it's not as simple a dilemma as you might think. Oh. What, no, the brother-in-law is 19 or the kid? The kid is the 19. Kid. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. You got to tune. Yeah. All right. So, Kevin, uh, is there anything else we want to talk about in the business section? No, just sign up at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. Pick your own support level and then pay that once a month and get over- $700 a month. <laughs> this is Pick not a- that. There's no support level. One million dollars. <laughs> we'll take it. You don't have, it doesn't cost that much, but if you have that, like, we'll 100% take it. Does that sound the business section, Yeah, Kevin? I think that's a good place to end. Seriously, it's like the five bucks, six bucks a month. It's not a big deal. Thus ends the business section. I'm going to go ahead and fade that music out right now. At Staples Business Advantage, our experts can help you find furniture that fits any design and budget, while AI can recommend products based on preferences, generate 3D models for visualization, and optimize space planning for office furniture. Take advantage of our team's eye for style and design. And my eye for, wait, I have no eyes, only algorithms. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations plus our team's experience to make furnishing an office space easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. 
I never did anything to harm my daughter or my granddaughter. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. Okay, so this is something we were talking about before the break, Toby, is that there have been a tremendous number of shows like this. Obviously, though, we have... At the center of this show, a really compelling spokesperson for the victims in Sochil. Could you just talk about her a little bit? Because she obviously is a really compelling central figure in this documentary. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like she kind of makes the documentary right without her. Like, I don't know if you can make this or if you do. It, it, it's quite a bit different. Now that I'm out of La Luz del Mundo, my life is so different. I don't have a reference of not knowing the church or not remembering the church. It's always in my memory. You know, she's had this sort of nightmarish experience. It seems as though she didn't receive like the worst of it when she was a child. But starting when she's a teenager, she gets kind of brought in. I think she's producing television shows or radio shows when she's in high school. And this starts a relationship with Nason even before he becomes the new head of the church. And so she's just extremely, she has a lot of charisma and a lot of courage. And she's sort of a leader of this movement. I mean, she seems to be the spokesman on on television, like when CNN or, or one of the networks or, or one of the, um, the Spanish speaking U S or Mexican networks, Univision. Uh, yeah. 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 Telemundo and stuff. Want to talk to somebody. It seems like she's there, but she also, you know, this continues on until fairly recently. And I, I think you alluded to it earlier where she's married to this guy. Was his name? Shamin. Mm-hmm. And she continues to be the victim of sexual abuse at the hands of Nason while she's married until he finally kind of just, dis- uh, Shamin sort of discovers what's going on and helps her sort of rescue herself. So yeah, she's got a very compelling story. There's another woman who also had a really compelling story, which I wish we'd kind of gotten a little bit more into, except she's in prison, which probably was like part of the, <laughs> part of the issue. Yeah. Alondra. Um, yeah. Yeah. But they, they talked to her, her husband, and so I think that was sort of the second, it's sort of, I, I kind of felt like that was sort of on the third tier of like different things that were happening, but it seemed to me, and I, I think I saw a note that Kevin thought it was really interesting too. That seemed to me to be like a really fascinating story that they can only get so far into. Right, right. Yeah, I agree with Toby that uh, social is the real emotional center of this documentary. You know, every victim has the right to be heard and to tell their story but not everybody can really articulate their story sometimes in a way that resonates with other people. And so it's always great when you can find somebody like that because I think it helps the viewer understand a little better. And I think she does that. She's really good and compelling as far as her on-camera presence and the story that she has to tell. I also agree that, as Toby alluded to, that the Alondra Campo story that aspect was something I was I was hoping we'd get a little more of because she really is sort of like the Ghislaine Maxwell of this operation. And then she gets painted by the prosecution for sure, yeah. Yes, but I mean, I think in her own words, or at least what we know, is that not only was she a victim, but she became an abuser by grooming and, and finding the women, or the young girls, I should say, to give to the apostle. And I don't think, I don't know if we have sort of settled in our minds and how we feel about victim abusers Um, because we're kind of torn. Right. And and that seems to be one of the things that we've been trying to, we've been struggling with through all of these documentaries that there are people there, that there are mitigating circumstances to the role that they play in the abuse, especially when the original abuser is still there and still wields power over them. But social admits to doing the same thing to a lesser degree before she got out. And that's what was interesting to me. She was also 
telling young girls what they had to do to prepare for these same things. This was the pattern of abuse. And I think that Alondra, just like her life became that. And you know what I mean, Laura? It's it's really fucking complicated. It's very complicated. And as I was watching it, I was just thinking of the parallels to the Jeffrey Epstein case mm-hmm. where we had these girls, if you recall, when we were watching that documentary that were from poor places in Florida and they were being brought in to remember massage him. And then they would tell the other girls, oh, we can get you in to massage this guy. You remember that? That was the whole shtick there. But it's again, it's that pattern of grooming the victims to then use them as I don't want to say pawns, but you know what I'm saying for them to then take it to the next level where they are then working on the behalf of the abuser so that they're not getting abused in some cases because they are getting new victims, except in the cases where we've had in this particular story, girls that were like, my younger sister is way too young. Yep. Yeah. This is bullshit. And this isn't going to happen. Yeah. That was, I think, different in some regards than some of the other things we've seen where we saw older victims kind of setting down a line when it came to younger girls being brought into the fold. I have a really hard time with the Alondra Ghislaine Maxwell comparison with the prosecution. Yeah. Makes a really fucking hard time with it. Ghislaine Maxwell has a lot more fucking agency and power sure. yep. than this woman had. And Ghislaine Maxwell was living in a fucking million dollar mansion 12 miles from our house before she was arrested. And yes, I don't think Ghislaine Maxwell probably suffered zero power dynamics and abuse, but Ghislaine Maxwell also had a father who was a billionaire and came from very distant different circumstances. A very, very different kind of story. And But there are parallels to the but actions. Hearing, they, but hearing yeah. Social's story, yeah. and how I think Social could have become an Alondra if she hadn't gotten out. I really, really do. And the thing that I thought was interesting watching this and watching Social and like talking to all of these people, there were so many parallels between this and watching season one of Escaping Nexium. Mm-hmm. Except that I actually liked all of the people in this. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, Sochal reminded me so much of Sarah Edmondson, who, like, I don't want to say I hated Sarah Edmondson, but I also, like, couldn't relate in any way to Sarah Edmondson. I'm, like, former actress. She also became the head of this MLM, and she was also bilking people and, like, all these things. And it's, like, you know, I, you're sort of conflicted about how you feel about the things she did because she was a very willing member of this cult. And Sochal is, like, you know, she even physically resembles Sarah Edmondson a little bit. And I'm like, but I really like her and I really feel for her the whole time. And she comes from a very different place. And then you have Alondra's husband, who is just so unbelievably earnest. Like he's the anti nippy. And you have like all of these people. And I'm just like, I feel for these people so much more. I so wish this came out before something like Escaping Nexium came out. You know what I mean? Well, that's ultimately, I think the the issue is that we... This kind of documentary has become a subgenre unto itself. You know, the exploitation of the followers. And again, whether it is the folks from the Jeffries from Keep Sweet, and then we have you know, Bikram and the Bhagwan from Wild Wild Country. Keepers. The Keepers. I think at this point, it's important for victims to be able to tell their stories and for us to understand that. But as far as what the filmmakers need to do, they have to kind of present something new. Or I should say something different or present it in a different way, because some of the victims here are starting to look the same to you, Rebecca. Right. You're like, you know, we see parallels from this story to that story and this one and this one. It's starting to become sort of like this uh, artistic log jam because we keep getting obviously the same kind of sins happen in the world and they need to be reported. But that doesn't necessarily make for a good documentary, which is what we're talking about here. Yeah. And there were things that didn't happen on camera. Toby, you point out that we hear about a woman being rescued by the FBI, which I believe was probably true because she talks about it in court, but that's not as part of the story that we got, right? Her being kidnapped and brought to Jalisco, an American citizen who was a woman. And there are details like that. And one of the more compelling characters here, too, is a point of view we haven't seen before is we have this attorney who represents victims of cases like this. And she brings a really interesting point of view, but like, We hear her very narrow take on a couple of these victims and like she's brought in very late. 
So that sort of expert take, you know, is is just very narrow. Toby, did you feel like there were some arcs here that like, well, one, first of all, I just want to say amateurs built that fucking church and I would never walk into that building in a million <laughs> years. Like that was wild, right? That this huge building built but it's by cra- amateurs. I mean, it's, it's exactly what, uh, what the Jeffs did, right? Yes. You know, and it's like, wild, let's wild go this place people. and we'll, we'll, you can just like build it for me for free. It'll be awesome. Even though it's huge. It's a huge cathedral in the middle of a city. It's like it's, someone built that giant Mormon tabernacle thing, except it was just a volunteers. The construction was done totally by voluntary people. They were not paid. Nobody. But we enjoyed doing it because there was part of the work to make the church bigger and better. But they at least had like a guy who was an architect and like an engineer who was like overseeing it. And I think it's so did the Egyptians. Wild Wild Country was the same thing where they had like real like professionals. Whereas the Jeffs, I think it was just like, let's just throw this thing up. You know, they they were builders. I still would be Um, uncomfortable walking into that building during a storm. I would be uncomfortable for a lot of reasons. I'm not sure it collapsing on me would be the number one reason. Yeah. Um, (laughs) You know, to what Kevin was saying, I mean, I think... I, I feel like we've seen enough of these that it's like, was anything surprising? Like, did anything like jump out at you and you're just like, oh shit, I can't believe that happened. Cause to me it was just like, Hmm, yep. That seems about right. You know, it's, it's, it's all this stuff is horrible. And some of the details are like super, super disturbing. And you know, I don't even know what to say about it, but beyond that, just the dynamics just seem so familiar at this point. And, yeah. the, you know, the struggles that the people who do get away. And, and what was kind of interesting to this is that another thing that we're kind of used to is the church or the organization or whatever really seeking revenge on the people who leave, right? Like through violence or intimidation yeah. or whatever. And they kind of give lip service to this, but there's they don't really show it at all. Like you get that little bit that's in that Rebecca was just talking about that uh, is, in, is in the court testimony. And, you know, you do hear social talking about how, like, once we do this, you know, we're in danger, but there's no, that's about it. Conversation there was that just that has. one guy who spoke out and then was, was stabbed. Up, yeah. He was in the hospital. and yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that one guy. Yeah, I guess that's true. I forgot about him. And her taped conversations with those guys were pretty good, too. When yeah. they came to their house and they were like, you know, and they had to, were offering to buy their house. and But that wasn't, you know, that was more just like, Let's just make this normal, guys. Right. I mean, up. yeah, that didn't seem like intimidation. That seemed like it was like, can we buy you off? Right. You know, what, mm-hmm. what do we have to pay yeah. to make this go away? Yeah. At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things. But I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations, plus our team's experience, to make stocking your team's break room easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. I want people to understand this ordeal. It's taken a toll on both of us. Casey Anthony's parents respond after 15 years of allegations. I've gotten blamed for something I didn't do, and it tears me up inside. This can change our life. This is serious. This is their final response. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now, only on A&E. And watch next day on the A&E app. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. All right, let's do what we do. Let's let our listeners know, should they check out Unveiled, Surviving La Luz del Mundo. It's the latest documentary exploring this kind of like messed up situation with sexual abuse in a religious church slash cult. It's on HBO and HBO Max. Laura Bricker, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Unveiled? I'm going to go mild thumbs up. I didn't love this. And I think that 
is just sort of indicative of the fact that we have watched so many cult shows and a lot of them start to sound very similar. What I have been saying about this when I tell people about this is what struck me is this is a Christian based cult in what is a, you know, appears to be, if you look at it from the bird's eye view, a Christian church, it is operating on a huge scale And I think the reason that you should watch this is, and this is kind of a spoiler, at the end, there's a statement from the victims in this who feel that they really gained nothing from coming forward in this case because of what happened in the outcome of the criminal case. And so for that, I would like to say you should watch this so that you can learn about this crazy ass freaking cult church and know what they're up to. And If you find out like me that there's three of them in New Hampshire and a couple of them in Maine, go expose their shit and raise up the victims who came forward in this case who didn't necessarily get the outcome in the judicial system that they should have gotten in this case. Hmm. Toya Ball, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Unveiled on HBO, HBO Max? You know, I think I'm a a thumb sideways. You know, sort of technically and everything, it's well done. I think the stories you know, sort of in a vacuum are compelling. I think social, who's the, the sort of central personality in this is is very compelling. But I guess this isn't really a spoiler. Everything that happens, you kind of expect at this point, if you've seen other things like this. So, you know, there's a no point I was where I was just like, oh, I can't believe that. You know, it all just seems very kind of predictable based on all this other stuff we've seen about similar things, large institutions, institutionalized sexual abuse. That being said, you know, so it, it, it's it's well done. It's just a story we've seen again and again and again that shouldn't take away from the experiences that these women had and the importance of that. But just in terms of like, are you going to sit and watch three hours of this? You know, again, I, I just kind of feel like I'd seen this kind of story several times by now. So it's a thumb sideways. Kevin Flynn. I'm actually going to go thumbs down. Um, I think that... The stories that the victims tell, they're compelling, and I think that it's important for victims, you know, for the world to hear them. But as far as the documentary, which is what we're reviewing here, I think this is pretty rudimentary. We have seen this story over and over in different kinds of documentaries. That's in part because these kinds of crimes all have similar features, but it's up to the filmmakers to come up with a way that is different and not derivative a way that's compelling and not copying. So, by the way, I just did all that alliteration, like off the top of my head. I'm pretty fucking good, right? Yeah, it's and, awesome. Yeah. It's good. All right. Thumbs up, Kevin. Thumbs up. I'm going to just say, hey, the best thing is like, yeah, they paced it out for three episodes because that's about all the narrative could really hold. I wish them luck. But as far as a documentary, I just got to say it's a thumbs down. Um, I'm thumbs up on this one. It's a story I didn't know anything about. I don't disagree that the documentary could have been stronger in like a, production wise it could have been made more creatively that being said it's a story that once i got into it i wanted to know more about especially when i googled the light of the world church and realized there were three branches of it right in my own state one of them just a few miles from my own house and realized that this is the kind of crime where women who aren't white and people who aren't white don't get the same kinds of results that people who are white get i really think it's important that this me- this media be out there um So, you know, in part, I don't want to discourage people from watching it, but also in part, I really, really felt for the main characters in it that were obviously real people. And I think they were very compelling and very likable and told their stories very well. So for that reason, I can in good faith give it a thumbs down. So thumbs up for me for Unveiled. All right. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast. A little something I like to call Crime of the Week. That. The Weber County Sheriff's Office is mourning the passing of one of their own. Canon officer URL had spent eight years sniffing out criminals in Utah. The dog specialty, finding porn. The chocolate lab was certified in, quote, electronic storage detection, meaning he could sniff out things like SD cards and USB drives hidden by suspects. Often, the drives contained illegal content. So URL earned the nickname, the, quote, porn sniffing dog. Authorities say URL has a 22% success rate, finding digital evidence that investigators would otherwise have missed. After his retirement, URL moved in with his handler and his family, where he lived until passing away December 30th. Panel, it's a 
may be a good thing that URL did not go sniffing around our houses, but what would he have found if he did at your house, Laura Bricker? Oh, boy. Um, I think he would have found some things that perhaps my cats had hidden in the box spring under my bed. Oh, oh it's the cats. It's the cats who <laughs> um, ripped a hole in the box spring and they just bring all sorts of contraband in oh, there. Oh, yes, they do. Toy Ball, what would a URL, the USB, we'll call it sniffing dog, have found at your home? I would be very upset they will confiscate my uh, DVD of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about you, Kevin? Well, uh, he probably would have found my uh, edition of uh, Disney's Polka Hot Ass. <laughs> at, our, at our house, he would have found 10 million old USB sticks and cables that we don't know where they belong. They, yeah. they fit nothing. They have nothing on them. We don't know where we got them. And uh, we don't know where those cables fit or what they do. Save them. We might need them someday. <laughs> exactly. That's going to do it for us. But before we go, folks want to reach you on social media. Laura Bricker, how can they find you there? They can find me at Laura Bricker to tell me what their cats stuff in their box springs. Toya Ball, what about you? If folks want to celebrate your pronunciation of Gricature and other fine things about you, <laughs> how can they find you on social media? Uh, please do at Toby Ball NH. Kevin Flynn, what about you? How can you be found? I'm at Kevin P. Flynn. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram or other places, you can find me at Reb Lavoy. Follow the show on Twitter at Crime Writers On, and I encourage you to join our incredible community in our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. We also have a regular old Facebook page. Just go there, hit join the group. We'll let you in if you're not weird. Support the show at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. You'll get the Crime Writers On after show, Married With Podcast, Laura Brick Leave It to Bricker podcast and Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcasts. Our theme song was composed and performed by the brilliant Ty Gibbons. Our line editor is the wonderful Olivia Burdett. And repatriated. The executive producer of this fine program is the very American Kevin P. Flynn. This show was recorded in the Treehouse Yoga Studio above the Mockingbird Cafe in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi Studio, otherwise known as Studio C, the closet in our New Hampshire basement, where our dogs protect our copy of the movie. No, not saying that. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. No, 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 no. Yeah. What was he trying to make you say? Bang, bang. Not saying that. <laughs> Not saying that. Throw mama on the train. <sighs> Legends Jesus of Christ. my balls. <laughs> 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 that one's funny. <laughs> that one's funny because it's about a dude. The dude, the dude title is the best. Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things, but I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations plus our team's experience to make stocking your team's break room easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.